21. So uh, we can have uh, verses 1 to 21. Can we have that on the screen? That would be great. Okay, so now there was a, a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the signs you were doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, Jesus said. And do you not understand these things? I, very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen. But still, you people, do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life in him. Well, we're going to come back to that in just a moment. Um, and and um, in particular, if you are someone here this morning who doesn't yet know Christ personally, who hasn't been born of God's spirit, then I'm praying that by God's grace, you would listen in really carefully this morning as we consider this wonderful part of God's word and that if you are already his and you know him and you know what it is to be born of the spirit and to have Christ having made his home in your hearts and to know him by faith then um, I pray that you're encouraged as we go through so let's let's just launch straight in um, and verses verse three so it says now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus who was a member of the Jewish ruling council he came to Jesus at night and said rabbi we know that you are a teacher who has come from God for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him so there's this uh, religious man, Nicodemus. Um, I'm sure you've heard this passage many, many times. Um, and he's deeply fascinated by Jesus, isn't he? Um, he's drawn to him. There is something about this Jesus that is utterly compelling him, even though the other religious leaders are describing as, uh, him as being from Beelzebub and, and dismissing him and trying to find fault in him. Nicodemus just cannot go along with that. There is something compelling him to consider Jesus more carefully and more closely. In fact, um, he's been looking at these miracles that have been performed and he comes to him at night. And we're not told why he came at night. Um, you know, perhaps uh, he didn't want his friends to know that he was convinced that there was something special about this Jesus. Um, maybe it was just he couldn't sleep because there he is living in the vicinity of this man who is causing the blind to see, the deaf to hear, the mute to speak, the, uh, the lame to leap for joy. And he just can't get this out of his mind. He, by the way, whatever it was, he is compelled to come. Perhaps he was becoming afraid knowing that there was something of the presence of God in the area where he was living, walking around, um, and he was beginning to be convicted. Who knows? But either way, he is weighed up 
what he has been seeing. The evidence of his eyes and his senses are telling him this Jesus must be someone who is especially close to God. Maybe this felt like a big step for him. Um, this acknowledgement of Nicodemus and his friends. You know, we've seen the miracles, we've weighed the evidence, and now we know, he says, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. God must be with you. We know. So perhaps Nicodemus was expecting some sort of affirmation of that, some sort of commendation. I don't know. We just don't know. Is this you? Are you someone who... When we talk about being born again, you haven't got the faintest idea what people are talking about. But you know enough about Jesus to know that he is someone incredibly special, someone who you've come come to a firm conclusion that he is a great moral teacher and that someone to be listened to and his ideas taken on board. Maybe someone who is close to God, maybe even a prophet, who knows? Well, here's what Jesus says to Nicodemus, and this would apply to you as well. He says, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. No one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. You know, everything um, Jesus said was true, but here he starts by saying, so sort of, very truly, I say to you, he wants you to know, he wants Nicodemus to know, he wants me to know that what he is about to say is something incredibly important. And we need to tune in with all of our hearts and souls to what he is about to say. And this is what he says. No one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. Your spiritual eyes cannot be opened until you become a new creation. You cannot know what it is to have God as your king, to be within his kingdom, unless you are reborn. There was um, many years ago, a little um, toddler, 20 month, 22 month old toddler called Gardell Martin, who was uh, living in Pennsylvania in the United States. And um, he fell into this icy river. Um, by accident and and got swept away and uh, they eventually found him um, his lifeless uh, body no pulse no breath um, no life no hope um, it seemed of reviving himself certainly no hope of that but after being found someone came along and this icy little toddler uh, and and started breathing into this body And 101 minutes after falling in and drowning, he started to breathe again and uh, life returned. And actually there were no ill effects, um, maybe slightly traumatized, but um, no other otherwise physical ill effects of what, what had happened. You see, without Jesus, without God's spirit, you are a spiritual ice block. You are without spiritual sight. Um, You're without life. You're without a spiritual pulse. You do not know God. You are outside of his kingdom. You can no more save yourself than a dead person can revive themselves. You have no hope except that someone comes and breathes life into you. And the word translated again, as in born again, it can also mean born from above. It means from above. You need the spirit of God to come down from above to show you what it is to fear God, to shake your pride, to shake you out of unbelief. You cannot even believe unless God's spirit comes down from above and starts working upon your soul. Being born again is entirely the work of God. Only Jesus can save you. 
He has the power to bring you from death to spiritual life. He can open your eyes. He can show you your need of forgiveness and then bring you that forgiveness and apply that forgiveness to your heart so that you know that you have been forgiven. Only God's spirit can enable you to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ for the very first time, whereby you know things that are unseen. You know the one who is hidden from view. And you can know him with a certainty that passes all description. If you believe that Jesus was a great moral teacher or someone from God to be listened to, you're wandering in darkness. If you believe that Jesus is someone who must have God with him, But that's all, then you are spiritually dead. You have not even begun really to start your journey towards knowing anything of real importance. You're not even born yet. And you haven't begun to see. See, turning over a new leaf um, cannot get you into heaven. Uh, You must be born from above. Trying to be a better person and living a moral life will not bring you forgiveness that you need, and it will not change you from within. To become a child of God, you must be born of the Spirit of God, the Spirit of Jesus. Like Nicodemus, your religious background, your religious uh, religiosity just counts for nothing. Uh, You must be born again. You can have a first class degree honours from Oxford and Cambridge University. Know all human wisdom. It is worthless when it comes to gaining access into God's kingdom. Your kindness to members of your family uh, and your friends, uh, the fact that you are deeply loved by them is of no use before the throne of God. Being impressed by Jesus isn't enough. Uh, No matter who you are, no matter what you have done, if you want to know God, if you want to have everlasting life, then Jesus Christ must enter you by his spirit. You must repent. You must turn away from sin and come to him humbly as a small child and receive him as your saviour, your lord, your king. Coming to know God is so fundamentally life-transforming that elsewhere in the Bible, it talks about passing from death to life, this being born again, from blindness to sight, from darkness to light. So you must be born again born from above. But secondly, you must be born again of God's spirit. So Nicodemus, he is still completely confused. Uh, How can someone be born again, he says? You know, how can someone be born when they are old, he asks? Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born? So here's Nicodemus, this religious leader. He's completely at a loss. He does not have a clue what Jesus is telling him. Perhaps you're the same. You just can't get your heads around it. You just don't understand it. Inwardly, you kind of throw up your your arms in confusion, um, and it makes no sense to you at all. And here is how Jesus explains it to, to you and to me and to Nicodemus. He says this, very truly, I tell you, No one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. The wind blows. So you should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. So what does Jesus mean when he says that you cannot enter the kingdom of God unless you are born of water and spirit? Well, the phrase water and spirit goes back to 
uh, Ezekiel, something that was set, said through Ezekiel, the prophet, many, many years before, uh, where, where God said this through him, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities and from your idols, and I will give you a new heart, a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. So here's Nicodemus who's probably um, believed all of his life that he's going to earn his way into God's kingdom by law-keeping, by rule-obeying. He's, um, but he's just hearing that he is powerless to save himself by his own morality. It's not going to get him in. Perhaps you're the same. Perhaps this is how you understand Christianity to be. Perhaps you think it's about being a good person by your own efforts, by your own righteousness, with as much effort as you can plow into it. Maybe you're as zealous as Nicodemus and his friends were, and you're really trying hard. You're really giving it your best shot. Bible is clear. It's not enough. You must be born again. You must be born from above. Um, what's the law for then? Why did God give us this wonderful law, the Ten Commandments, and these wonderful commands. Well, Paul explains it like this, the Apostle Paul. He says, God gave the moral law for this reason, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, he says, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin, of our sin. So uh, imagine um, a room now uh, with a sort of thick layer of dust in this room. And uh, for as long as the dust remains sort of settled and undisturbed, the room looks pretty tidy, looks fairly clean, looks all right, doesn't it? Um, but then someone comes along with a really stiff broom and gives it all their might sweeping this floor and up comes the dust into the air choking whoever's standing in the room and um then you wait for a little while stop brooming and then gradually the dust settles back down again and the room looks fairly clean again but the dust is still there the filth is still there isn't it and that is a picture of the human heart. Um, from the very beginning, uh, the sort of wellspring of your thoughts, of my thoughts, of our words and actions has been unclean. And uh, you may go for long periods of time without even noticing that there's this uncleanness in your heart. Um, but you are unclean on the inside if you are outside of Christ, if you have not been born from above. How can you know? Well, listen to God's law. That's the broom. When we listen to God's commands, it shows us just how far short we fall of the perfection that is required of us by a holy God who flung the stars into space, who knows, who knitted us together in our mother's womb, who knows our every thought and word and deed better than we know ourselves. And here's some examples of some of God's standards declared through Christ. Anyone who is angry with his brother or sister will be subject to judgment. Have you been angry? Brother or sister? Anyone who looks lustfully has already committed adultery in their heart. How do you fare on that? On that level, uh, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. If you love only those who love you, what reward will you get? I, are not even the tax collectors doing that? There's another one. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth 
but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where your treasure is there, your heart will be also. How are you doing on the, on the greed front? Uh, what comes out of a person is what defiles them. For from within, out of a person's heart, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, folly. All of these evils come from inside and defile a person. And if by some power of self-delusion we're still sitting thinking, no, I'm okay on all of those fronts, here it comes. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. You're guilty before God. We all are guilty before God. The law of God shows us our guilt. It silences us before him. Obeying his rules cannot save us from what we already are and what we've already done, what we've already thought, what we've already said. There may be times when the dust has been out of sight and you think you're doing all right, but occasionally you hear God's law and there it is. You see your need of forgiveness. Self-righteous morality is powerless. It's like, it's like sticking, rotten, sticking fresh apples on a rotten tree. It's of no use whatsoever. And Jesus goes on to say in verse 8, The wind blows where it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. So like the wind, God's spirit goes wherever God pleases. Like the wind, God's spirit can be felt even though he is unseen. When God draws near to you by his spirit, you begin to fear God. Your righteous, mighty, holy judge, the one whose law you have broken. And you start to feel conscious of your sinfulness before him. And you start to realize your desperate need of forgiveness before him. An urgency begins to dawn on your soul. And uh, you begin to realize there is a judgment to come. And you know what? For all of us in this room, it is so near. When we will be there on that day before Christ, our, your life, my life, we're a passing morning mist. We're a fleeting breath. Our life is transient and passing before we breathe our last and go before the Lord for judgment. And God's spirit persuades us that these things are so, that this is true, that this is real. And eventually, Everyone who comes to know God is then brought to their knees humbly before him and like a little child is caused to call out for the forgiveness that we need. It's simple. Lord, have mercy on me. Forgive me, a sinner. I'm, a, I'm found out. Please forgive me. And the very moment that a person comes in that way to the Lord God, the wind of God, the, um, the uh, spirit of God comes into your heart for the first time, into your innermost being. The moment he opens up your blind eyes, you see for the first time that Jesus Christ is Lord and that indeed he is your saviour and you're forgiven before this mighty God, the one who you feared you now rejoice before the one who you who struck you with terror because you knew you were guilty before him becomes your closest, most treasured, most wonderful friend. That moment, everything changes. The moment you are born again of God's spirit, everything is made new. 
You are made a new creation. The heavy weight of the guilt that you are carrying is lifted from you. And you know a peace that just passes all understanding. New life has begun, knowing without a trace of a doubt, as you now do, that Jesus Christ is Lord. You love him and you rejoice in him. You love to hear um, the Bible, um, which you may not have done before. You love to be with God's people. Uh, you might have had to have been dragged along before. You love to be near your saviour who is now in you by his spirit. Heaven above is softer blue. Earth around is sweeter green. Something lives in every hue. Christless eyes have never seen. Birds with gladder songs overflow. Flowers with deeper beauties shine. Since I know as now I know that I am his and he is mine. That's what it is to be born again. It changes everything. The striving ceases. The, the, the attempt to prove your worth before God just pass away. Jesus has done it all. He has taken away all your guilt, all of your shame, and you are safe in him. And you know it. There's Nicodemus. How can this be? He's still in the dark. He's completely bewildered by this, um, by this teaching. Perhaps you are still confused, even as you listen to these things. Jesus says to Nicodemus, you are Israel's teacher and you do not understand these things. Very truly, I speak. I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen. But still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? Jesus has explained how you are to enter the kingdom of God by using illustrations from the world um, that you might be able to understand, that we might be able to understand, that Nicodemus might understand. He's spoken of the spirit of God being like the wind unseen and yet powerful in its effect. There's a yellow weather warning. It's almost like it's it's there for illustration purposes today. Um, he has reminded you of God's promise from long ago um, that one day God would wash away all uncleanness in the hearts of his people and give them new hearts, new life, new birth. These are things you can understand. But now Nicodemus asks the question, how can this be? How can a holy God, who is perfect and just and fair, how can he simply wash away sin by his spirit? Well, here it is. Are we ready? Last point now. No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. So you must be born again. You must be born again of God's Spirit. And you must be born again of God's spirit by believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Or the same time as believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus takes us back to a time when the Israelites are, are in the wilderness. They're, they sinned against God. They were under God's judgment. And these venomous snakes have been sent out amongst them, uh, causing death and panic. And there were people dying left, right and center, thousands, in fact. And uh, the people who had been bitten were given this mercy. They could save themselves by looking up at this bronze serpent that had been stuck on this lump of wood and lifted up and was being carried back and forth throughout the camp. All they had to do was look and live. Believe that by looking, and you would live. Just trust in that command. Look 
to the bronze serpent and you will live. And, that, and that's what happened. Now, what's all that about? Well, the serpent, if you remember, way back in the beginning, was the creature that was cursed by God for the sin that it brought into the world. And uh, it's a cursed creature. And there, up on this lump of wood, is this cursed creature. Look at this cursed creature and you will live. And what an extraordinary picture of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross, that is. The one who would become sin for us. The one who would be cursed in your place. The one who, there's God's wrath, righteous wrath, a holy God who is pure and perfect, a consuming fire who we cannot even look upon because we are so unclean. The one who Isaiah, the great prophet, who when he even saw a vision of him, couldn't even begin to look in the direction because he knew he was unclean, a man of unclean lips who lived amongst the people of unclean lips, couldn't even look upon the, the sort of glory of this being who is our creator. And yet... There is this wrath of this God ho ho coming down upon the people who deserve to be punished, to be condemned for their sin. And then up comes this cross with the Son of God. And that wrath is diverted away from you and on to God's dear, beloved, perfect Son, because he loves you. He loves you so much that he would give his one and only son to take away your sin, that you might never know what it is to be condemned, that you might know God, that you might be born again by looking to Jesus, believing in him and being saved. The moment you believe, the moment you have God's spirit come into your hearts to empower you to believe, you are saved forever. And when this transient morning mist of a life passes, you will be shepherded into Jesus' presence forever and ever. What a glorious salvation. How can you expect to escape if you ignore so great a salvation? Now, there are people here today um, who I can guarantee you will know what it is to experience this very thing of being born of God's spirit. This is reality. You can know that which is unseen. I remember it uh, back in 1997 over in India in some dusty yard. I'd gone out to India filled with arrogant pride, thinking the world was my oyster, just interested in carnal desires and partying and all kinds of things which were just pure hedonism. And that was all that I was doing out there and God had other plans. And he brought me low, showed me that he was real and convinced me of the darkness of my heart. And then in some dusty yard in a place called Trichy, uh, with about 500 Indians and this wonderful Christian lady opposite me, we prayed together, or she prayed for me. And as we prayed, God's spirit came in. And I believe for the very first time, I can remember the moment. Now, that's not how it is for everyone. My wife can't remember the exact moment, but she knows that at some point she knew that Jesus Christ was her Lord. That's what it is to be born again. Have you been born again yet? Do you know? Do you know that which is unseen? Have you come like a little child and said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Please forgive me. I know I need this. I want to believe. Help me believe. Forgive me my sins. Trust in the Lord Jesus. Well, I pray that you will know what it is to be born again. And um, if you have not, if you're still like Nicodemus, there's still that doubt. 
holding you back and keep coming under the sound of God's word. And I pray that in the coming days and weeks and months, you will know what it is to pass from death to life, from not knowing to being absolutely sure of the things that are unseen. Let's pray. Father, we uh, thank you for the joy of being born again. Father, we thank you for your mercy in sending your one and only son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, Father, we thank you for that precious day when you opened our eyes to believe and be saved. Father, we thank you for that precious day when our guilt was washed away, when we came to know peace with you. Father, when we came to know that one day when we see you face to face on that great day, Lord, when we stand before your throne, we need fear no condemnation, not because of anything we have done, but all because you loved us and you sent your one and only son to die for us and you gave us faith to know that. Lord, we thank you and praise you for the joy of being found in your kingdom, in your family, safe and secure for eternity. Come what may in this life. Lord, we um, praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.